So let's talk about the 1902 coal strike. Um, the image says that this particular strike is, is going to be a little bit different than <clears throat> the strikes we've talked about before in class because it has a different ending. So the coal strike of 1902, also known as the anthracite coal strike, was a strike that was organized and led by the United Mine Workers of America, um, focused on, for the most part, focused on the coal mines of eastern Pennsylvania. The miners went on strike for higher wages, uh, shorter work days, and the recognition of their union by management, the United Mine Workers of America. They threatened to shut down the winter fuel supply of, to major American cities if they didn't get their demands heard. At the time, uh, most people heated their homes with anthracite or coal, hard coal, which produce a higher heat value and less smoke. Um, the strike never went through. Um, Theodore Roosevelt arbitrated between the, the leadership and, and, and the workers, represented by the United Mine Workers. Um, thanks to that arbitration, um, some good results came out of it. Um, the strike never happened. The miners received the 10% wage increase and reduced work days from 10 hours a day to 9 hours a day. And the owners got a uh, guaranteed higher price for their coal. However, they would not recognize the United Mine Workers as the official bargaining agents um, <clears throat> for the coal miners. Um, I guess we could say this is a good thing because it didn't end in any bloodshed. Um, but it was the first um, labor dispute in this country which was settled by the federal government. Who intervened as a as a neutral arbitrator, and you know it could be a sign of things to come. Although we're not going to see this sort of um, arbitration from the federal government as a norm until pretty much the 1940s. <clears throat> Next up is the the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire. Um, we spoke about this in class. Um, this would be probably um, the most tragic. Uh, mass event in New York City until 9-11. Um, shirt waist. These were um, shirts, I guess, that were uh, very much in style among women um, early 20th century. Um, this factory employed, for the most part, all young women, most of them immigrants. On this one particular day, um, it was a Friday, I believe, and they had had trouble in the past with young women leaving the workplace a little bit earlier. Um, and they were suffering from the same problems that pretty much every factory was at that time. Very long hours, low pay, um, pretty much the standard. Long story short, the, the, the management, so this happened on March 25th, 1911. The management, in order to keep the girls from leaving on Friday, and also, there apparently was a problem with the girls perhaps stealing fabric um, from the company. They go home and maybe make some side work and make some side money. So, but you know that doesn't justify what happens. Um, apparently, they they put a bit of clothing or what have you um, behind the door to 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 to, to kind of a, as a weight against the door so nobody would leave early. And that's what exactly happened. Apparently, it was a fire. Um, I guess it was still cold in, in, in New York that that, um, that particular day. And they were still using, you know, indoor heating, coal, what have you. I guess they had a coal burner in the corner, uh, so if, if I remember the story correctly. And, well, long story short, nobody really knows. But um, some reams of fabric caught on fire. And before you know it... Um, the upper floors where this factory was was um, located were engulfed in flames basically um skyscrapers were a new thing in new york city there was no fire trucks that had any ladders that would extend that far up um and because of that it was it was essentially a a, a real tragedy um waiting to happen these young women and we're talking about teenagers um <clears throat> you know forced um to make a choice um, 
either, either stay in the building and burn alive or, or jump to their deaths. Um, let me see here um, how many floors it was. Try to find out for you. Um, well, most of the most of the victims are between 14 and 23 years old. Uh, 62 people, 62 young women, um, jumped to their deaths. Um, seven floors, a seven-story building. That's um, that's pretty much um, the distance that they were falling. And it says 150 perish. Oh, so that wasn't 62. Uh, well, 62 jumped. Uh, I guess the others died in the fire. It says 150 perish in a factory fire. Women and girls trapped in a 10-story building. So you know, 10 stories, not 7 stories. Lost in flames and hurl themselves to death. Um, so, so what does this do? What does this event prompt? It prompts major, major reforms in workplace safety that are eventually going to become the norm across the country. For example, one of the things um, that this tragedy um, led to was, was doors that opened up outward in all workplaces. That was one of the things that it led to. So, you know, th this fits in the, in the progressive era because, you know, reforms are going to come out of this tragedy, particularly when it came, uh, comes to workplace safety. Then we're here with the Lawrence Textile Strike of 1912, also known as the Bread and Roses Strike. So a little background, um, Lawrence, Massachusetts, um, home to quite a few textile mills. Um, and, and this goes all the way back to the, the Lowell Textile Mills. The New England area was at one point the epicenter of uh, the textile industry. Um, this particular strike um, was a strike of mostly immigrant workers. It was led by the IWW, first major strike in which the IWW um, actually organizes and leads. Uh, it was about a two hour pay cut uh, <clears throat> that corresponded with shortening the work week for women. Uh, the bosses went ahead and shortened the work week, but shortened uh, everybody's paycheck as well. And, um, that's what led to the strike. Um, <clears throat> on January 1st, 1912, uh, Massachusetts government enforced a law that cut mill workers' hours in a single week from 56 hours to 54 hours. Those are the two hours less. And, and, the, and the bosses went ahead and, I guess, cut pay as well. And, and, and the workers weren't having that. Um, <clears throat> this particular union, uh, this particular strike, um, it, it was led by Bill, uh, Bill Haywood. Um, one of the things that he did that brought attention to the strike at the national level, and right here we could go to the next slide, what Haywood did at the national level was masterminding the idea of um, sending hundreds of the strikers' hungry children to sympathetic families in New York and New Jersey and Vermont. And of course, this drew widespread sympathy for the strikers, um, especially after the police had stopped any further children from leaving um, Lawrence. Uh, and of course, this led to violence at the Lawrence train station. Uh, there were congressional hearings uh, which followed, which ended up exposing the shocking condition in many of these mills. Uh, the owners soon decided to settle the strike, giving workers in Lawrence and throughout New, New England raises of up to 20%. Within a year, however, the IWW had largely collapsed in Lawrence, and, and so did their, um, their benefits, uh, what, what they gained from this strike. Um, and, and, of course, it also became a, a norm. Um, when they called out the Massachusetts um, militia, uh, which this was one of the strikes that the militia was called out. They also imprisoned the the leaders, the local leaders, not Big Bill Haywood. Um, so yes, it was sending those children out and, and the authorities responding violently that um, put pressure on the on the mill owners to not only to give them back the pay that they lost, um, but actually increase pay by twenty percent. So. 
I guess it was a success by the IWW, okay? Because um, Haywood was uh, threatening a strike, a general strike of, um, of, of, of the entire IWW if they didn't release the leaders of, um, of this particular strike in Lawrence. But the IWW is, is, isn't going to last, you know, at least in Lawrence much longer after that. Um, in total, three people died um, in the, the strike for bread and roses. So that's one of the many strikes. I mean, the progressive era, full of reform, but it was not a stranger to um, labor unrest. Probably the most uh, troubling example of, of labor unrest happened in 1914. So by this time... Uh, Woodrow Wilson is president. Uh, likes to think of himself as more progressive than, than his uh, the presidents that came before him. Uh, the London massacre was part of a, of a of a bigger labor situation in Colorado between miners and uh, <clears throat> the name of the company here because it was owned by by Rockefeller. The Colorado Fuel and Iron Company, they own various mines and sites in Colorado, owned by Rockefeller, actually. Um, <clears throat> the Ludlow Massacre was a massacre resulting from strike breaking. The Colorado National Guard and the Colorado Fuel and Iron Company guards attacked a tent colony of 12,000, I'm sorry, 1,200 coal miners and their families in Ludlow, Colorado to break because uh, they had occupied the site to get them out of there, I guess. So on April 20th, 1914, National Guard using machine guns to fire into the colony. Approximately 21 people, including wives and children, were killed. Uh, John D. Rockefeller, owner of the company, was for the most part uh, blamed for having orchestrated the massacre. But as you can imagine, from somebody so rich and powerful, uh, nothing came out of that. Um, what were they striking for? They wanted the recognition of the United Mine Workers as their union. Uh, they wanted better compensation for the amount of coal that they dug, which is a very rough job. I mean, you have to understand that. They wanted an eight-hour workday. They wanted payment for what they called dead work, which was work that was not necessarily coal mining, but still supportive of coal mining. Uh, they wanted the right to use any store and to choose their own boarding houses and doctors. Because remember, this was a big issue with mining towns. Um, the company owned the housing. The company owned the stores. And they, all the money that they handed out in paychecks, they got right back. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, this, this was not one that ended well whatsoever. Um, total deaths. About 20, 12 of them were children, and, and one bystander. So I think that's going to be it for our, our, our labor unrest. I mean, there's there's more to come. I mean, I'm going to save that for another PowerPoint. But in 1919, there's a steel strike, and then this, and, and then race relations in this country are just absolutely in the toilet, particularly when when the war ends. So we'll come back to labor unrest, um, but that's going to be after the, the the progressive era, because labor unrest after the progressive era is going to be tinged with with extra stuff, uh, what we call red baiting, um, because of events that happened in 1917 in Europe. They're going to take on a different character.